GHS 105. Passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. Chapter 47. Chapter 47. Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. 
Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again he measured a thousand, and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again he measured a thousand, and brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the desert, and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Injidai even unto Enagleum. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. But the miry places thereof and the marishes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade. Neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Thus saith the Lord God, This shall be the border, whereby ye shall inherit the land according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions, and ye shall inherit it, one as well as another, concerning the which I lifted up mine hand to give it unto your fathers, and this land shall fall unto you for inheritance. And this shall be the border of the land toward the north side, from the great sea, the way of Hethlon, as men go to Zedad, Hamath, Barotha, Sibrium, which is between the border of Damascus and the border of Hamath, Hazer Hadakon, which is by the coast of Horan. And the border from the sea shall be Hazar Enon, the border of Damascus, and the north northward, and the border of Hamath. And this is the north side. And the east side ye shall measure from Horan, and from Damascus, and from Gilead, and from the land of Israel by Jordan, from the border unto the east sea. And this is the east side. And the south side southward from Tamar, even to the waters of strife in Kadesh, the river to the great sea. And this is the south side southward. The west side also shall be the great sea from the border, till a man come over against Hamath. This is the west side. So shall ye divide this land unto you according to the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you, and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you. And they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that in what tribe the stranger sojourneth, there shall ye give him his inheritance, saith the Lord God. Chapter 48 Now these are the names of the tribes, from the north end to the coast of the way of Hethlon, as one goeth to Hamath, Hazar Enon, the border of Damascus northward, to the coast of Hamath. For these are his sides east and west, a portion for Dan. And by the border of Dan, from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Asher, and by the border of Asher, from the east side even unto the west side, a portion for Naphtali. And by the border of Naphtali, from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Manasseh. And by the border of Manasseh, from the east side unto the west side, 
a portion for Ephraim. And by the border of Ephraim from the east side, even unto the west side, a portion for Reuben. And by the border of Reuben from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Judah. And by the border of Judah from the east side unto the west side shall be the offering which he shall offer of five and twenty thousand reeds in breadth and in length as one of the other parts from the east side unto the west side and the sanctuary shall be in the midst of it. The oblation that ye shall offer unto the Lord shall be of five and twenty thousand in length and of ten thousand in breadth and for them even for the priests shall be this holy oblation toward the north five and twenty thousand in length and toward the west ten thousand in breadth and toward the east ten thousand in breadth and toward the south five and twenty thousand in length and the sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the midst thereof it shall be for the priests that are sanctified of the sons of Zadok which have kept my charge which went not astray when the children of Israel went astray, as the Levites went astray. And this oblation of the land that is offered shall be unto them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. And over against the border of the priests, the Levites shall have five and twenty thousand in length, and ten thousand in breadth. All the length shall be five and twenty thousand, and the breadth ten thousand. And they shall not sell of it, neither exchange nor alienate the firstfruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. And the five thousand that are left in the breadth over against the five and twenty thousand shall be a profane place for the city, for dwelling and for suburbs, and the city shall be in the midst thereof. And these shall be the measures thereof. The north side, four thousand and five hundred, and the south side, four thousand and five hundred and on the east side 4,500, and the west side 4,500. And the suburbs of the city shall be toward the north 250, and toward the south 250, and toward the east 250, and toward the west 250. And the residue in length over against the oblation of the holy portion shall be 10,000 eastward and 10,000 westward, and it shall be over against the oblation of the holy portion, and the increase thereof shall be for food unto them that serve the city. And they that serve the city shall serve it out of all the tribes of Israel. All the oblation shall be five and twenty thousand by five and twenty thousand. Ye shall offer the holy oblation foursquare with the possession of the city. And the residue shall be for the prince, on the one side and on the other of the holy oblation, and of the possession of the city over against the five and twenty thousand of the oblation toward the east border and westward over against the five and twenty thousand toward the west border over against the portions for the prince and it shall be the holy oblation and the sanctuary of the house shall be in the midst thereof moreover from the possession of the levites and from the possession of the city being in the midst of that which is the prince's between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin shall be for the prince. As for the rest of the tribes, from the east side unto the west side, Benjamin shall have a portion. And by the border of Benjamin, from the east side unto the west side, Simeon shall have a portion. And by the border of Simeon, from the east side unto the west side, Issachar a portion. And by the border of Issachar, from the east side unto the west side, Zebulun a portion. And by the border of Zebulun, from the east side unto the west side, Gad, a portion. And by the border of Gad, at the south side southward, the border shall be even from Tamar unto the waters of strife in Kadesh, and to the river toward the great sea. This is the land which ye shall divide by lot unto the tribes of Israel for inheritance. And these are their portions, saith the Lord God. And these are the goings out of the city on the north side, four thousand and five hundred measures. And the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel, three gates northward, one gate of Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi. And at the east side, four thousand and five hundred, and three gates, and one gate of Joseph, one gate of Benjamin, one gate of Dan. And at the south side, four thousand and five hundred measures, and three gates, one gate of Simeon, one gate of Issachar, 
one gate of Zebulun. At the west side, 4,500, with there three gates, one gate of Gad, one gate of Asher, one gate of Naphtali. It was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be, The Lord is there. You have just listened to the Bible reading, and we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray.
Good morning, everyone. I, I, I said good morning, everyone. Great morning. Grand miracle. Upon your life. Upon your ministry. The Lord has brought you here, brought me here, connected us together, and is raising us to a higher level. Amen. Your family, higher level. Amen. Your ministry, higher level. Amen. In your church, higher level. Amen. Now they tell me that, you know, it's not only deeper like Bible church that is deeper. Now, everyone deeper. Amen. Everyone higher. Amen. And you will go higher ground in Jesus' name. Amen. The strength you need. Amen. The grace you need. Amen. The power you need. Amen. The backbone you need. Amen. The Lord will grant you everyone. Amen. We appreciate our can choir singing hallelujah chorus classical. Nothing to be compared with that. And we appreciate all our music people and lead, they're leading us in worship. The Lord has blessed us through you. And the Lord will bless you in return. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name for what we have gone through. And Lord, we come to this final chapter of Second Timothy, we are praying that your word will impact every life. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We've been in Second Timothy. We've done chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Now we come to chapter four. If you have not been here. It will be good for you to lay hold on the messages because they're in a series together and they will bless your life. Even if you have been here, it will be good for you to listen over and over and over again so that the blessing that we have stored for us in all those messages, they will be permanent in your life in Jesus' name. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1, Paul the Apostle writing to Timothy, by extension, writing to you and to me, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Verse 2, preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This morning we come to the message and acknowledge minister with an absolute mandate. A minister with a mandate acknowledged by the Lord, acknowledged by Paul the Apostle, and then is given a mandate that is absolute. An acknowledged minister with an absolute mandate. There are three things we're looking at as we look at the chapter. Number one, solemn charge to an equipped minister. Here is the solemn charge. The apostle was giving to this minister who had been equipped, equipped by the scripture, equipped by the spirit, and equipped by the apostle, the servant of God. Number two, sustainable cause of an exemplary mentor. The mentor is Paul the apostle, and he had been exemplary, exemplary in life, exemplary ministry, exemplary focus, exemplary in the calling of God upon his life. And he had been the mentor, a good mentor. And the cause he had followed is sustainable. is passing the baton 
to Timothy and he wanted Timothy to sustain that same thing that caused that he had gone through. Number three, strengthening channels for an effective ministry. For us to have effective ministry, there are channels of blessing. There are channels like rivers that flow into our lives. And those channels help us to remain strong and strengthened for the ministry. Let's come to number one. Number one is the solemn charge to an equipped minister. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 again, verse 1. It says, I charge thee, solemn charge. By the way, this was the last epistle that Paul the apostle wrote. And it says, I charge you. It's the last chapter of his life. And the last chapter he has laid down for us. And he said, I charge thee, therefore, before God. The charge is before God. If you're a minister, if you're a leader, if you're a mentor, if you are somebody helping other people to go and to grow in the Lord, whatever charge you give must be a charge before the Lord. You cannot charge people to do things that God will not approve of. You cannot say, by my authority, I am an overseer. I am a pastor. I charge you to do this. Hold on. The charge must be before God. It's like you should see God standing there and Christ standing there and in agreement with God and with Christ. You now charge the people. You see, there are some ministers, they misunderstand authority and they use authority in the wrong way and they will tell their members and tell the people listening to them I am the pastor here, I am the leader there, I am the founder of this ministry, and I, by my authority, I charge you, don't believe this, don't read this, don't go that direction. And as we look at the charge he's giving, he's telling the people, don't listen to the truth, don't observe the truth, don't preach the truth. Here I am the founder and I don't want the whole Bible preached in my congregation. You cannot do that. The church we give will be before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. And then it says in verse 2, it says, preach the word. Preach the word. That's the charge. We're looking at three things. Number one, the perpetual charge to preach the word. Perpetual. It's always there until the end of the world. Number two, the prevailing challenge to preserve the word. The prevailing challenge to preserve the word. Number three is your personal commitment to proclaim the word. Let's look at number one. Number one, the perpetual charge to preach the word. We've read that already, but let's look at verse two. In verse two, it says over there, preach the word. How can I preach the word? Number one, I must possess the word before I can preach the word. You possess the word, and the word possesses you. You are not a preacher, you are not a minister that is not reading the word, that is not taking in the word, that is not personalizing the word, that is not living by the word. Number one, you possess the word and the word possesses you. Number two, you practice the word. Now, how can you tell other people, 
do this and you cannot do that yourself. If your family is not upright and you are then telling other people, I am a family counselor. How can you be a family counselor when your own family is not settled? Number two, you practice the word, perform the word. Anything the Lord had given in the word, perform this. I have done this to show you an example. All things that are written in scripture, they're written for our learning that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You perform the word. It is in that performance. But if you only read the Bible on Sunday and you only preach the Bible on Sunday and Monday through Saturday, you don't perform, you don't practice. When you get to the office, you just live another lifestyle and it is not by the word. You cannot do this and then preach the word. We don't come from the jungle of sinfulness and then open our mouth and then begin to preach the word. There is salvation. And the salvation makes you to understand if any man be in Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. And it is after you have possessed the word and the word possesses you after you are rising up and you are living the word and you are practicing the word and you are performing the word and you possess portray the word to the world in your life. Those who are not reading the Bible, they will read the Bible through your life because you portray that word in your life, in your language, in your disposition, in your action, in the day, in the public, in the night, in the private, when uh, you are covered by darkness, in the dark there, anywhere you are, in your personal life, you are portraying the word of God. It's only after that you can come now to us and come now to the congregation and preach the word. You cannot preach the word in isolation. And it says, be instant in season and out of season. You see, there are times we don't feel very happy. We don't feel very excited. There are times some physical things are happening uh, that are not uh, conducive uh, to, you know, proclaiming the word. But whatever the situation, you know that I am committed to possessing the word and the word possessing me. I am committed in season, out of season. There is no vacation from practicing the word and there is no vacation from performing the word there is no vacation from portraying the word you are declaring the word by your life all the time and of course there's no vacation from preaching the word uh, many some people say that they will keep on preaching the word they will not retire from preaching the word i agree with you but number one you must not retire from possessing the word in the world they say the higher you go the cooler you become and it appears that there are people that think that the higher we go in office the higher we go in our title the higher we go in our authority in the church in the workplace in the family then uh, all the younger people, they can possess the word, they can practice the word, they can perform the word, they can portray the word, but we, we have graduated. This goes on for life, that you possess the word all through your life. You practice the word all through your life. You perform the word all through your life. You portray the word all through your life. And you preach, number one, you preach for life. You don't preach for death. You preach for restoration. You do not preach to encourage people to sin and to backslide. You preach, number one, you preach for life. Number two, you preach for liberation. That's why we preach. They are bound. They are changed. They have habits that bind them. And they have things that destroy their lives. And then you come, preach the word. Why? To liberate the people. We preach for light. 
that he is the being in darkness that you paul the apostle you will turn them from darkness to light and so we measure what we preach why am i preaching i'm preaching so they can come to life i'm preaching so that can be liberated i am preaching so that the light of the gospel will shine in their lives in their heart i pray to be so in every life in jesus name i'm coming to number two there number two is the prevailing challenge to preserve the word look at second uh, timothy chapter four and i'm reading from verse three it says for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lost shall they heap to themselves teachers having each in ears and then it says in verse 4 they shall turn they are away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables <clears throat> here tells us about the spirit of the last days the spirit of the last days and the spirit didn't just come is the spirit of Pharaoh that will hear the word and say, I hear you, Moses, I don't accept, I don't know that God. And the people today who hear the word, and it says in verse 3, it says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, and they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's the spirit of Pharaoh. And that spirit led Pharaoh until he perished in the Red Sea. It's the spirit of Manasseh that God sent prophets to him and the declarers of the word, the proclaimers of the word. And Manasseh said, I will not listen. It's the spirit that had been going on from the Old Testament. And it came to the people of Judah. And the people of Judah told Jeremiah, as for the word you are spoken from the Lord, we will not hear. And today, that same spirit in Pharaoh, that same spirit in Manasseh, and that same spirit where the Jews still remain today. And Jesus Christ came, and the Pharisees possessed that kind, that kind of spirit. And when he declared the word of God, they will not hear. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. It's the spirit in Ahab and Jezebel. He wanted to go to war. And then uh, Jehoshaphat said, Are there not other, are there not real prophets here? He said, There is one here, Micah by name. I hate him because he does not tell me what I want to hear. What he hears from the Lord, that's what he says. And then he gathered other prophets before him. And all those prophets began to tell him, Go, and you are going to overcome. He went, that's where he died. And from there, he went to the that great beyond that spirit is here today in the world and if that spirit visits you in your own personal life visits you in your own ministry you remember hey that was the spirit in pharaoh you remember that was the spirit in manasseh you remember that was the spirit in the people of judah you remember that was the spirit in uh, the pharisees and the sadducees that said we don't want to hear the truth the spirit in ahab and jezebel that made them perish look at that verse 3 again and understand that now with the understanding of Pharaoh, understanding of what happened to Manasseh, what happened to Judah, what happened to Ahab and Jezebel, what happened to the Pharisees, it says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heed to themselves teachers. <coughs> in each in ears and then it says in verse 4 it says and they shall turn away their ears from hearing the truth and it shall be turned unto fables i pray that spirit will not have authority or power on any of us in jesus somebody shout amen, amen. <clears throat> For our 
water of life. I'm coming now to number three. Number three there says, your personal commitment to proclaim the word. When you are born into this world, you are born by yourself. You didn't have to ask, Mommy, can I breathe? Should I breathe? Should I cry? Should I say anything? There are things in life that are personal. There are things, if you're going to make progress, that personally you know to remain alive, to remain connected with the Lord, this is personal. This is not something you are asking for permission. Can I preach? Can I believe? Can I get saved? Can I get healed? I've heard about heaven. Can I prepare to go to heaven? Do not allow society. Do not allow the crowd to come to the inner circle of your life and dictate to you what you should do. If you're like that, your life depends on people. Your death depends on people. Your eternity depends on people. What you spend eternity depends on people. No, there are things that are personal from your salvation to your sanctification to your service to preparing for heaven. This is your personal commitment that you say, the Lord has given me the word. And because he has given me the word, I don't need permission, the permission of anyone to believe for my salvation. I don't need the permission of anyone to believe in holiness. I don't need the permission of anyone to prepare myself for heaven. That heaven, you will go in Jesus' name. Your personal commitment to proclaim the word, but understand, to possess the word. To practice the word personal that nobody is saying you can't do that but Jesus said that's what I'm to do but the word of God says that's what I'm to do no permission from anyone and I pray you'll do the word of God you'll keep the word of God and you will make God number one in your life Christ the Savior Number one in your life in Jesus' name. Look at this in Second Timothy chapter four, verse five. It says, "Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry." Here, Paul the apostle, as a mentor, was talking to uh, Timothy. And it was saying, watch. It's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's not a proposal. It is not an opinion. This is the word of God. And if you're going to stand in the Lord, if you're going to courageously commit yourself to what the Lord has appointed for you to do, here is a commandment for you. Watch your watch by opening your eyes and looking at everything around you and whatever is contrary to the revealed word, you'll say, no, I can't go that way. I can't do that. It's coming from a man. It's coming from a woman, respected man, dignified woman. But what's coming from him, from her, is not according to the revelation of the word of God. Watch. You must open your eyes. It's not everybody that comes to you and he says, we're preaching the word, we're standing on the word, we're bishops, we're this and that, that is actually representing the Lord in their personal lives, in their private lives, in their public lives. It's not everyone. Therefore, you will watch. It's not just that so and so told me, such and such told me, watch. Number one, you watch with your eyes open. Number two, you watch by prayer. You're saying, Lord, there are things I see I don't understand. There are people that cross my way. I can't tell whether they are up or down, they're good or bad. I don't know the future, whether they will lead me in the right direction or not. 
you watch my prayer. Open my eyes, Lord, that I may see. You will watch the stumbling blocks. You will watch all the obstacles. If you're just walking and walking, and then you say, I can go anywhere, I can do anything, and you're not careful, you're not cautious, you will fall. That's why it says, watch. You will look at all the stumbling blocks on the way, all the hurdles on the way, and as you take care and you are careful, you will not fall in Jesus' name. And then you watch by looking at your own peculiar weaknesses. Don't forget that each one has peculiar weaknesses. Something had his peculiar weaknesses. He did not watch that area. Gideon had his peculiar weaknesses. He did not watch that area. Not only that, what you are watching in other people's lives, and you are telling them, young man, don't go that way. Young woman, don't go that way. What you warn other people about, and you watch other people for, you watch also in yourself. Even David, he wasn't watching. When he ought to watch, he was looking in the wrong direction. You must watch. And so, you're going to do the work of the Lord. It's not the work of the Lord that we do with carelessness and, you know, stumbling blocks are there. We're falling every day and we're rising up. And every night we're going back to God. Oh, God, I've sinned again. I am a sinner saved by grace. I'm always sinning. I am weak. Help me. And then you cry crocodile tears. And then you come back to the pulpit and say, praise the Lord. That one is just habit. Anyone can say, praise the Lord. Because you've done it so many times, you can do it again. But watch, watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. There are afflictions that come in, way, in the way of our profession. The doctors, they know what they have to go through in training. Real thing they have to endure. And engineers, they know what they have to go through. Carpenters know what they have to go through. Every profession has its challenges. And the ministerial profession, preaching the word of God, has its challenges. You will endure. But if you have the language, I cannot take this. I didn't know it would be this tough. I didn't know that, you know, to stand upright and to stand straight, you have to go through all this. Are you going to make it? But you endure. You will endure. I said you will endure. We, you know, we talk about Moses and we say that, you know, that man, he took millions of people out of Egypt and he led them to the land of Canaan. That's true. But he had to endure quite a lot of things. And then he said, do. Do the work of an evangelist. How do you do the work of an evangelist? Number one, you will go out of your local church. Your local church, the people you've been preaching to every time, they're saved, they're converted, they're baptized, they take the Holy Communion, they have conferences all the time. If you're there, there's no sinner, no new person there that, that has not heard Go out of that place where you have been. Then you'll come back. What you do in the church, you are edifying the church. You're not evangelizing the church. If you're going to evangelize, you go where the sinners are. If you're going to fish, you go where the fish are. If you're going to do soul winning, you go where the souls are. Do the work of an evangelist. And then when you go there to the place where those sinners are, it's not only the sick, yes, sinners are sick, they're also sinful. It's not only the people that have demonic challenges, yes, sinners have demonic challenges, they also have destructive lifestyle that will make them perish, that will lead them to hell. And so to do the work of an evangelist, you present the Savior to the sinner and you tell the sinner the steps he will take to repent and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that he will be saved. Now, you will not tell a sinner and you will not tell a believer. 
that God will not condemn you for anything, only for the sin of not believing on Jesus. There's nowhere that is stated in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, that God will not condemn you for any sin except you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 says, All that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21 says, These things I told you before, and I'm telling you again, that he that doeth these things shall not inherit, shall not get to the kingdom of God. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Mortify the sin. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 says, Come out among them and be not partakers of their sins. Because it's because of those sins, the wrath of God, the plagues, the judgment is coming upon Babylon. So, we're not telling them, God will not condemn you for anything, for fornication, for adultery, for idolatry, and for witchcraft, and for sorcery, and for emulations, and for all those things. All those things, they don't matter to God. They matter to God. And so, as an evangelist, we go to them, and we declare to them these are the sins that will condemn any sinner except they repent. And now the times of ignorance God winked at, but now he commands every man everywhere to repent. That's the message of the evangelist. And that's the work of the evangelist. Do you? the work of an evangelist. Then he tells us, make full proof of thy ministry. Make full proof of thy ministry. The proof of your ministry is the fruit. You are a fruit producer. You get people, they repent, that's the fruit of the ministry. You get people, they repent and they are converted, that's the fruit of the ministry. Now, you must check up your ministry. Are you bearing that fruit? Are you making a full proof of your ministry? I pray the Lord will help everyone. It will help you. I said it will help you. We're coming to number two now. And is the sustainable cause of an exemplary mentor. What a mentor Paul the Apostle was. Not only to Timothy, to Titus, to Tychicus, to Luke, to Mark, and to all those people. And as the Lord raised him up as mentors, he dealt with his ministry in truth. And now he came to the end of his ministry. And it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, For I am now ready. It's wonderful to know when you are ready. When we're going to school, sometimes, uh, you know, they tell us an exam is coming and we're not ready. Sometimes it's an external exam. The examiners are outside. They are not our teachers we are familiar with. And they say the date of the external exam now is this. And we are not ready. There are many people that cannot say with Paul the Apostle, I am now ready. I'm going to meet the God of heaven who gave me the ministry. And who will know every flaw in that ministry. I will examine and will judge according to the truth. And they cannot say before God, I am ready. They are going to meet Jesus Christ who gave the great commission. And he said, you do this. Don't subtract, don't add, don't alter, don't mutilate, don't adulterate. The same thing I've given you. You continue until the end of the age. And you are going to meet that Jesus who is going to evaluate everything you have done. And they are not ready. And there are people who just go on in life like that. And they just feel that, well, whether I'm ready or not, I'm going to heaven. 
No, it's not so already. That word ready comes up many times in the New Testament. And Jesus himself used that word. Be ye ready therefore. For you do not know the time or the hour when you will come. If he said we should be ready, well, we're just running and running and moving on and moving on. The family is not settled. And yet we, you know, we're just running on. Our lives are not settled. And we're just running on. And Jesus said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Our righteousness is so superficial and we do not have the grace that leads us to holiness and righteousness and we're just running, get ready. There, there is no point of, you know, just <clears throat> doing everything we're doing without our readiness. I pray you'll be ready. By personal devotion, I pray you'll be ready. By presenting everything on the altar, oh Lord, you know me, this is what I am. If there is anything I'm overlooked, if there's anything I'm not thinking about, I want to be ready. The Lord will make you ready in Jesus' name. For Paul the Apostle, he was ready. For Stephen, he looked up to heaven and he said, I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He was ready. And for Peter, you see, when he was in the prison and they were going to chop off his head, the following day, he slept like a baby until the angel came and got him up and got him out. He was ready. The people who know the ministry, who know the Lord, and they're serious about ministry, every time they remain now ready to be raptured, to go to heaven. Paul the apostle said, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. You know, sometimes when you are going to leave a particular place, maybe you are a professional, a policeman, and they are transferring you from where you are now and to go to another place. If you have some attachments that you cannot do without, if you have some affections you cannot do without, it will pain you that they are moving you from this place to another place because your heart is there, your affection is there, your mind is there. The things that tie people down, they are there. But Paul the Apostle, he said, my mind is over there. My heart is over there. He said, I even have, uh, you know, some choice whether to go or to stay. And I'm only staying because of the ministry he has called me to. But now he said, I'm ready. Ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I'm not going as if, oh, look at what I'm leaving behind. When the Lord has saved you, has cleansed you, has touched you, has made you holy, and God has made you faithful all through in ministry. When the time comes, your mind will not be here. You'll be ready to go. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, I have fought a good fight. He said, it was a good fight I fought. And I don't feel guilty about the fighting for sound doctrine, a good fight. Fighting to save souls, a good fight. Fighting against those bees in Ephesus so I can take souls out of their mouth. That's a good fight. Fighting to lift up Jesus Christ and to bring Satan down. That's a good fight. Fighting to maintain the word that the Father had delivered to the Son and delivered to him. He fought to maintain that. That is a good fight. Not a personal fight. Not family fight. Not you beating your wife, that one is not a good fight. And not uh, you biting your husband, that one is not a good fight. Not, uh, you know, a wife denying the husband uh, 
of what belongs to him. That one is not a good fight. I'm not fighting the church. You're not fighting the congregation. You people, you are not paying your tithe. You are not paying the offering. Look at our offering. Everything is gone down. What are we going to do? Is the pastor going to eat? That one is not a good fight. He was fighting to maintain the truth. He was fighting to maintain the sound doctrine all through to the end. And he could say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished. You know when you're finished, if you've done everything you ought to do, and you go through till the end of the journey, I have kept the faith. I didn't allow a drop, the dot of an eye, and the crossing of a T. I I didn't allow that to fall to the ground. I have kept the faith. And then it says in verse 8, it says now, a crown henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. He knew the certainty of the reward, what he was going to have. And then he said, it's not only for me, but also unto all them that love is appearing. What I've read to you there, there are three things. I've read them already. Number one, the call to fight a good fight like the mentor. Like Paul the Apostle, the call to fight a good fight like the mentor. Number two, the cause we must finish with manliness. The cause we must finish with manliness. Number three, the crown for the faith, uh, for faithfulness in the ministry. If we're faithful in the ministry, the crown that comes at the end of that will come to number one, the call to fight, a good fight like the best mentor. Now, if you're going to fight with a weapon, you need to be trained how to use that weapon. The soldier is called to fight. It's to fight the enemy. The enemies are trained in the use of their weapon. And so you then, confronting them or facing them, must also know how to use the weapon you have. The weapon of the world, it is written how Christ defeated the devil. The weapon of prayer, the prayer of decree, you must understand. The prayer in the name that can never fail. The prayer and the weapon of the spirit, the strong in the spirit and in the grace of God. You must know how to use all the weapon that Christ had given. And so, the call to fight, the good fight. Look at First Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 12. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. That takes grace. Fighting a bad fight that does not need any grace. Fighting your neighbor that does not need any grace. Every sinner can do that. And fighting for your right and becoming an activist that does not need the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Anybody can do that. And fighting the government. That does not take prayer. That does not take uh, growth or maturity. Anybody can do that one. And fighting uh, your parents. That one doesn't take any grace. Anybody can do that. With the depravity and the natural self, anybody can do that. The one that needs grace and that needs the power of God is the good fight. The good fight joining with Christ and rescuing souls from the kingdom of the devil lay hold on eternal life. If you cannot keep eternal life by fighting for something, that's a lost battle. You're fighting, you lose eternal life. 
You are fighting, you lose peace with God. You are fighting, you lose your assurance of relationship with God. That's a bad fight that makes you to lose your ticket to heaven. It's like, you know, somebody, he had his ticket, he wanted to, you know, travel, and he had all his money and everything in his pocket coat, and then somebody met him and challenged him. He said, what do you mean? And then he wants to fight. He removes the coat or the ticket and the money, and while he was fighting, somebody stole the coat and everything and told, stole it away. And then after he cooled down, and the anger has now come now, he's looking for the coat. The coat is gone. The ticket is gone, the money is gone, everything is gone. That's a bad fight. In your life, you look at, you're fighting for the truth. You're fighting for the glory of God. You're fighting to rescue souls from the kingdom of darkness. But you lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called, thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. And then it says in verse 13, in verse 13 it tells us, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickness all things. And before Christ Jesus, before who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good profession. Then in verse 14 it says, it says that thou keep this commandment without spot or rebukable until the appearing, until the appearing, until the appearing. How long are we going to preach salvation? Until it's appearing. How long are we supposed to preach holiness and sanctification? Until it's appearing. How long are we to preach one man, one wife, until death do us part? Until it's appearing. How long are we going to preach the word of God and the word of life and the word that Christ is going to look at when it comes? We keep on until it's appearing, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray he'll find you faithful. Amen. Amen. He'll find us faithful in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two there. Number two, the cause we must finish with manliness. The cause we must finish with manliness. Manliness, courage. Manliness, fortitude. Manliness, inner strength. Manliness, inner power. The cause we have started and we must finish with that courage, with that fortitude. We're not bending. We look at our lives and if there's anything that weakens you, if there's anything that makes you uh, to have less courage, and then, you know, let's say, for example, a minister is, you know, having some illicit affairs with members of the congregation. And as you stand there and you want to preach, then you see that a same partner face to face, eyeball to eyeball, you cannot be manly, you cannot be courageous, you cannot have fortitude, and you cannot rebuke sin and get people to repent. Why? Because... The person will say, uh -huh, they know how to talk, they know how to preach, but look at the man talking like that. And yet we are privately, we're doing foolish and silly, sinful things together. But when you come to the Lord, and the Lord cleanses your life, the Lord purges your life, and then you come to declare the word of God, you follow the cause. You're able to do it with manliness and courage because the one that strengthens you, the lion of the tribe of Judah, lives on the inside of you, and by the grace of God, is giving you courage, and that courage will not fail you at the time you need it in Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. It says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is now at hand. And then verse 7, it says in verse 7, I fought a good fight, I have finished my course. Well, are you telling Timothy? I'm telling Timothy so that Timothy will know. 
in spite of everything I have faced, in spite of imprisonment, in spite of persecution, in spite of opposition, in spite of the people, the Jews that didn't accept and they laid some heavy burden on me, all the same, I finished my course. You can finish. I said you can finish. But you know, if you're always uh, you know, looking at the challenges or the trouble, and you're always crying, and you say, I am, you know, weeping Jeremiah. You're not weeping Jeremiah. Jeremiah did not give up. Jeremiah did not say, this is too much. Weeping Jeremiah. He wasn't weeping for himself. He was weeping for the nation. He was weeping for the people that were not converted. I'm a weeping Jeremiah. No, Jeremiah said, the word is in my bone. Like fire in my bone. And so you are not a weeping Jeremiah. If there's no fire there, if there's no fervency there, if you're weeping for yourself and not weeping for the nation, that's not a weeping Jeremiah. But a person that will say, come what me in the grace of the Lord, in the strength of the Lord, I will move on. I'll keep on preaching the word until I finish. That's the man that God has raised up. That's the woman that God has raised up. And God will help you to finish. I will finish. I will finish. I will finish well. There are people that choose that word, I'll finish well. They're not going on well at this time. They want to finish well. They are not following the path of righteousness, holiness, sanctification. Now, they say, I'll finish well. If we're going to finish well, we must start well and continue well. And then at the end, we'll finish well. I pray the power, the strength, the courage, the stamina to continue well and to finish well, the Lord will give you in Jesus' name. I was um, a particular country. In this particular country, there was this great man of God, except that he didn't follow a particular part of the word of God. I don't want to mention the country. If I mention the country, those who are listening, they will know that's their country. Even now they can tell. And he had radio ministry. He had an extensive ministry. And he had heard what will presage and preach in the word of God. He'll go over the radio and then he will blast me and blast all the things that were said. And um, he had started well. He'll marry a man that is conduct my for a man and a woman. Later, he turned, if you are divorced, come and get you married. If your wife has, doesn't know how to cook and doesn't know how to iron your clothes very well and you want to push her away, say, it's all right, it's all right. You don't like her and you are not compatible anymore. Marry another one, I'll conduct the marriage for you. And then, but thank God, I continued. I said I continued. I said I continued. And then, eventually, he heard the word. And this is a radio minister. This is a popular minister. A minister that was known all over his country. And was convicted of God. And he said, I am wrong. And he didn't just say that privately. He went over the radio. He said, today I have a special message for the nation coming from me. I have been doing this and doing that. But now the Spirit of the Lord, by the Word of God, has convicted me. And I know I am wrong. And all of you, he told them, that I have marriage, have conducted a wedding for you, second wife, third wife, I want to tell you, I did that in disobedience to the Word of God. I have repented. And I challenge you to repent. And then he made right his way and he continued in the path of righteousness. And not too long after, the Lord called him to glory. He 
finished well. You will finish well. Things to repent of. Things to adjust. Things to make right. You make those things right. And then you continue in ministry. Another country. In that country, there was a man there. And this man, when he started the ministry, he was not moving on very well. And so he traveled to Nigeria. He came to Lagos. He slept at Bagada, that's where headquarters church is, for three days before he had a chance to see me. And eventually, I saw him. He told me about his ministry. And he told me it's not moving well. And he wanted anointing. He wanted power. So I laid hands on him and prayed for him. He went back to his country. As he went back to his country, the work began to grow. Success, expansion, multiplication, the Lord will give you. And then uh, he was on radio in that country. I was on radio in that country. And he felt he didn't want this man to have the same success he had in Nigeria. He didn't want him to come to his country and, you know, possess the land. And so if we preached anything uh, on, you know, maybe let's say Tuesday, Wednesday, when he comes to preach, Thursday or Friday, he will take the message of preach and throw everything out. He'll be direct. He wasn't, uh, you know, doing it surreptitiously. He'll be direct. And he did that every week until we said, there's no point that I preach. Then the following two days after, he will come and, you know, everybody will know that there's fighting going on somewhere. So we have to stop our own radio ministry there in that country so that he can continue if that is how to do the work of God. He did that for a long time. And then uh, I was to go there for crusade and minister's conference. And in that minister's conference, I told our overseer there, contact that man. And we can even use his church building. And so we did. We also gave him a, a message to preach. Since I was there now, I wanted to see how he would do it and still continue the fight. But you know, after I preached some messages there, and his own time now came, I was sitting down there, and he came and he said, Ministers, I cannot preach before I tell you something. I want to apologize publicly that this man here is the one that God used to raise me up. I went to visit him in Nigeria. He prayed for me and doors began to open for me. But in my jealousy, I began to criticize him. You know, on the radio, I opposed him. But now I want to tell you and I want to tell the whole nation I am wrong. He made his restitution right there and then he turned to me where I was sitting. He said, please forgive me, I am wrong. Now I will preach only the gospel and not preach to attack you. You know, if we're going to finish well, we have to do that. And we have to clean up our slate and clean up our lives and clean up our ministry until we finish with manliness. You'll finish with manliness. Am I talking to anybody here today? The word will bear fruit in your life in Jesus' name. No fight, no fight. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting the good fight of faith. We join all our efforts together and fight the devil. We'll bring the devil down in this land in Jesus' name. Look at number three now. Number three, the crown of faithfulness in the ministry. The crown 
for faithfulness in the ministry. It says in verse 7, latter part of verse 7, it tells us, I have kept the faith, faithful. Look at verse 8, it says now, a crown of righteousness, a crown is laid up for me, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. A crown is waiting for you. You will wear a crown. I said you will wear a crown. It's the crown of life. It's the crown of righteousness. And it's the crown for the shepherd. And I pray you will not miss that crown in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 3. We're looking at verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast that thou hast, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. No one will take your crown in Jesus' name. Point number three now. Point number three. What are the channels that will strengthen us? What are the channels that will keep us fresh, keep us alive, and keep us strong? Strengthening channels for an effective ministry. As we look at verses 9 or to, 20, to 22, Paul the Apostle mentioned some people there and he said he needed them. He wanted them because they were the channels of refreshing. The channels of strengthening for him in his ministry. Let me give them to you. Number one, the people of God. Real people of God. They'll bring encouragement. They'll bring love. They'll bring refreshing. They'll bring uh, all that you need to keep you up in the ministry. Number one, the people of God. Number two, the presence of God. The presence of God. He said, when he was in Asia, no man stood with him. But then he said, I was delivered by the Lord out of the mouth of the lion. The presence of God was there with him. Number three, preservation in God. Preservation in God, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, the Lord shall deliver me. The Lord will deliver you. That's all the amen. The Lord will deliver you. He said, the Lord delivered me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Preservation in God. Number four, partners approved of God. Partners approved of God. He spoke in verse 19 there, Priscilla and Aquila and the household, of Nicephorus, they supported him. They were partners in progress. They were partners encouraging him. Number five, the power of God. The power of God. That's the channel that will help you. That's the channel that will lift you up, strengthen you. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith, Unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The power of God. Number six, the promises of God. There is no challenge in your life that the promise of God does not cover. All the challenges of your life, all the situations in your life, the promise of God is there. And they are yea and amen in Christ. It tells us in um, for Second Corinthians chapter 1, reading there, verse 26, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. And then it tells us of the peace of God in Philippians chapter 4. In there, in verse 7, Philippians chapter 4, 
looking at verse 7, it says, The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That peace of God, that's the channel by which strength will come to you. I pray to be fulfilled in Jesus' name. And now the purpose of God. Paul the Apostle always kept that before him. He kept that purpose, the purpose of God, until that was fulfilled. Acts chapter 26, verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Keep that always in mind. This purpose. Keep that always before you. This purpose. Both of the things which thou hast seen and of those things which, that which, I will, which I will appear unto thee. And then the prophecy from God. The prophecy that went on his life as the Lord called him. It tells us in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, that's unto Ananias, that was to go to Paul, go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. That's the purpose of God, the prophecy from God, and of the plenitude of God, the fullness of God available for him. In Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 19. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. It says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that she might be filled with all the fullness of God, that the plenitude. And then he tells us in verse 20, it says, Now unto him that is able, our God is able. Our Savior is able. Our Redeemer is able. In whichever territory you are ministering, in whichever place you find yourself, His grace will be sufficient in your life. His power will uphold you unto the end in Jesus' name. Now, unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that walketh in us. Number 11 is the praise of God. The praise of God. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then shall every man have the praise of God. And Paul the Apostle was looking forward to that. He said, all I do, he wasn't looking for the praise of men, congratulations from men, exaltation by men, appreciation by men. He said, all I'm looking for is on that final day when God will uh, dig out all the hidden things, things in the private and things in darkness and things when nobody was there and I can have the praise of God. He said, that's my God. Goal, I pray that will be your goal in Jesus' name. And now the possibilities in God. That's the channel that brings strength and power and courage and manliness into our lives. When you know all the possibilities that are there in God and you know that power of, uh, of possibilities is supporting you and sustaining you and you know with that power of the Lord you cannot fail. I said you cannot fail. With the power of God behind me, beneath me, above me, beside me, around me, I cannot fail. With the power of God, say that. With the presence of God, say that. With the plenitude of God, say that. With the promises of God, say that. Say that. With all the possibilities in God above me. Beneath me, beside me, around me, 
and within me I cannot fail you cannot fail you will not fail you must not fail you must bring glory to God who has blessed you with his presence with his people with his power with his praise with his promises with his prophecies and with the possibilities in prayer you must you must replicate you must uh, reciprocate all that glory of God and the favor he has given you and then you go through life majestically knowing with all that coming from God and coming into your life you cannot fail I said you cannot fail in Matthew chapter 19 verse 26 Jesus beheld them and said unto them with men this is impossible but with God with God in you with God beside you with God supporting you all things are possible in your ministry all things are possible in your life, all things are possible. In your family, all things are possible. The things that were not possible until yesterday, from today, they now begin to happen. Yeah. The things you found difficult, all those many years, you say, I've been in ministry for a number of years. I wasn't able to do this, I wasn't able to do that, but now things are turning around. I will. I can. I must. I can succeed. I must succeed. I will succeed. I cannot turn back. I will not turn back. I must not turn back. I will go forward. I can. I said I can. Look at that obstacle there. I will jump that obstacle. Look at that hurdle there. It looks high. When I get there, the Spirit of God will lift me up. I'll go over that hurdle. Look at that mountain there. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. You'll mount up over that mountain. Yeah. Every river you will cross. Every challenge you will face. And every stumbling block will be removed in Jesus' name. Because the God of all possibilities is with you. He will go with you. He will not fail you. He will not disappoint you. All provisions that you need will come from God. All the help you need will come from God. Success. Where are you? Success, Amen. achievement, up. Ah, you're climbing Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we cannot go back to doing the work like we did it yesterday. Because this is a new level. Amen. This is a new day. Amen. This is a new power. Amen. And here are new possibilities ahead of me. And if I, at this age, I'm just starting now to begin to refire. I about to younger people, come, run along with me. Run ahead of me. What are you? Ready to run. Ready to run. Ready to run. Stand up and tell the Lord, I'm ready. I'm taking the baton from my mentor. I'm taking the baton from my father in the Lord. He's still refiring and running. I am ready, ready to run. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell the Lord. A new day, a new era, a new dispensation, a new possibility, a new challenge, a new power, a new personality. The Lord will accomplish that in your life let everyone hear you let everyone hear you and let everyone acknowledge you as a minister
a man of God, a woman of God. Anywhere you are, you are there standing for Christ. Preach the word. Possess the word. And let the word possess you. Practice the word. Live by the word. Don't drop the word at the altar. Don't drop the word in the church. Take the word with you to the office. Live it out. In the marketplace, live it out. In your family, live it out. Among your friends, live it out. Among enemies of the gospel, live it out. In your congregation, where well, you have preached before, but you are very careful. You are not preaching the whole word. You are looking at the faces of the people. You wanted to keep them with half lives. You wanted to keep them by the adulterated gospel. But now, you go to that same congregation. And you bring in the whole world that will make them repent the whole world that will turn their faces to the Lord and get them saved and then as you possess the world and the world possesses you you practice the word, you portray the word to the whole world that the life you live will portray, will portray the grace of God, will not portray the sinfulness of man, will portray the holiness of life that Christ gives. Your life will portray the power, the strength, and the courage that a man of God, a woman of God, ought to demonstrate. If you have openly, privately denied the word of truth, destroyed the sound doctrine of the word of God, because you are trying to please people, Today you repent. And today you turn totally to the Lord. And you say, now I'm ready to fight the good fight of faith. Ready to continue and to finish my course. Ready so that I will win the crown. Lay everything on the altar. No compromise again. No changing the word of God again. No weakening. That looting. The word of God anymore. What will Paul preach if he were here today? Go ahead and preach it. What will those apostles preach to sinners, to believers, to families today? Go ahead and preach that. You have all the channels of blessing, channels of refreshing, channels of strengthening coming your way.
And as you go back home, you take everything back to the Lord in prayer again. And you pray until the Lord strengthens your prayer. And the Spirit of God bearing witness with your heart. Now I am ready. Ready to live. Ready to preach. Ready to stand. Ready to defend the watch of life. Ready. And ready for his coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Amen in your life. Yeah. Amen in your family. Yeah. Amen in your ministry. Yeah. Amen with power in your life. Yeah. Amen with all the possibilities yeah. of God. Yeah. Amen for strength. Yeah. Amen for courage. Yeah. Amen for success. Amen. Amen for achievement. Raise up your hands. A new day. A new period. A new era. A new level of ministry. New power. New strength. New grace. New ability. And the Lord perfects His ways. In your life, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Father, we well, thank you for your ministers, your servants, men and women, professionals, men and women, young and old. Lord, we pray the level you have taken everyone to, the devil will not pull them down. Old lifestyle will not pull them down. Amen. Companions will not pull them down. Amen. The fear of man will not pull them down. Amen. And the pleasure of the flesh will not pull them down. Amen. I pray more grace in their lives. Amen. More power in their lives. Amen. More of your spirit in their lives in Jesus' name. And real focus for ministry, your grant to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I pray a new chapter will now begin to be written in every one of their lives and ministries. Amen. Lord, the old life, the old ministry of weakness, of falling and rising, of fear, of timidity, all that old life is gone. Amen. Now, Lord, the courage of the conqueror, Amen. the strength of the conqueror, Amen. the power of a conqueror, Amen. grant to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. All the lions before them will vanish out of the way. Mountains and stumbling blocks will vanish out of the way. And I pray they will move on in the work of the Lord, in the way of the Lord, in the will of the Lord with new anointing and with new refreshing and with new courage and with new power. Lord, these are your people, giants in the land, men and women that will cover this whole land with the gospel message. And as we use them, Lord, the knowledge of the true gospel will cover the land and the waters cover the sea. All the provision needed, grant to everyone. And I pray that your goodness and your mercy and your love and your compassion will flow to every life continually. You will not fail. You will not fall. You will not miss your way. Everything God says you should do, you can do. Amen. You will do. Amen. You must do. Amen. Go in the strength of the Lord and bring back testimonies for ministry. Amen. 
Lord, confirm it in every life. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.